Thank you, Brother uh, brother Bob. Come on up, and uh, we're going to dive into our study tonight. Uh, who remembers what we're looking at? Anybody? Anybody remember? Numbers. Numbers. All right. So Frank got uh, partially correct. I guess he was fully correct. We are in the book of Numbers. Uh, what did we look at last week specifically? What was that? The battles they had. In fact, uh, uh, we've certainly seen their battles pick up. Joe uh, corrected me the other night that they had had a battle before this. Uh, but you've certainly seen in what we looked at last week, these battles increase. The important part from last week's lesson, or at least I think it was important, was they were over here and they traveled around, got over in here, and they've kind of settled on this side of the Jordan. That's important because where they're actually going to end up uh, and moving across. And so what you've seen in that one chapter uh, of numbers or what we looked at last week was this uh, God getting them over here, get them prepared uh, for where they're going to go into the promised land. Now. I'll also tell you this. I said that God had led them through here, but they had battles along the way. Folks, you can be right where God wants you to be. You can be going the direction that God wants you to go, and he can lead you right into battle. You, I mean, you can't, he can't, as you follow the Lord, that does sometimes lead you right into battle. And you got to know that you got to be prepared for it. It doesn't mean that you're not in God's will. It just means that, hey, along the way, you're going to have battles. Uh, now, by the way, there are some times that you're in God's will and he's leading you away and Satan's the one that is doing the battling against you. And I would tell you, it's much better to fight against Satan than to run with Satan. And so it's absolutely okay to battle those battles. Uh, because they are going to happen. Uh, Brother Bob, what else? Did you have any any others on the recap uh, of what we looked at last week? Uh-oh. I don't know. I don't hear you yet. Maybe now. There you go. All right. Yeah. One of the things that we see here, uh, and we haven't talked much about the Midian, but uh, we will get into Midian nights tonight. And uh, they're further down. And Midian is where Moses ended up, if you remember, after he fled uh, Egypt there. He ended up here. And this is where Jethro, his father-in-law, was priest. And so what we see here, these are descendants of Abraham. And Brother Josh spoke Sunday about Genesis 25 and Keturah, his second wife. The fourth son listed in there is Midian. So uh, we all, they were also associated with the Ishmaelites, the Midianites, because when you read about uh, Joseph being sold into slavery in one place, it says Ishmaelites, another says the Midianites. So they were kind of combined uh, as one and lived in. But this whole area here, up through here, our descendants are related to Abraham. And... and Go, were you guessing well, and, and God was going to protect these descendants of Abraham because he told the children of Israel, don't battle them. You're not going to win. So that's why they're having to go around. But the Amorites here, we find, had captured part of Moab, the northern part, and also part of Ammon. Um, I would also say that it was asked of me Sunday a, a question that I'll go ahead and talk throughout now because somebody asked me if um, Esau was where the Muslim religion came from, but it was Ishmael. And so when you said the Ishmaelites, um, the, you can trace the Muslim religion back to uh, Ishmael. So those two sons of uh, Abraham, uh, Ishmael and Isaac, uh, you actually, the two primary religions of the world today can be traced, traced back to them to uh, Christianity, certainly to the uh, son of promise, which is Isaac uh, and Ishmael, uh, who was a son that was born from uh, not through Sarah, not of promise. 
uh, they devised their own plan. And the Muslim religion goes back to Ishmael. And so when yeah, you said the Ishmaelites, I just thought I'd throw that out. It's quite interesting. Out. And both of them were descendants of Abraham. And now they have been enemies for many, many years from, from this time here. And, and it's still, yeah, it absolutely still goes on today. But it is an interesting study mm -hmm. uh, to go through. Uh, but uh, I just, it was one of Abraham's sons. Uh, that it came through, but it wasn't down with Jacob and Esau. It was Ishmael and uh, uh, Isaac. All right. All right. Let's. Uh, we're going to look at uh, Numbers chapter twenty-two. Uh, is where we ended up last week. We read the first three verses uh, in it. I want us to read it again just to set up what's going on. There's an interesting story, Bob. I don't know if we're going to be able to get through it all tonight, but we're going to try maybe. We're Just, not going to be able to, are we, brother? Uh, not three chapters, if you're trying to. <laughs> this story takes three chapters. Uh, and, and so uh, we're going to dive into it. Let's start here uh, in verses 1 through 3. Then the children of Israel moved and camped in the plains of Moab on the side of the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was exceedingly afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. Yeah, so we wanted to, uh, what it, the thing that we pointed out last week that I wanted to reiterate here was look at how the people are responding to the Israelites now. How, how are they responding to them? What does it say how they responded? They was with dread. They were sick with fear. They were worried. And why were they worried? There's a great number of them. Now, it's interesting uh, that actually there are fewer of them now than, they, than there was when they started. Is that right, Brother Bob? 1,820 less. So it's not 1,820 right. less. <laughs> so uh, not too much. Not too much. But they're still uh, right at 3 million, or we anticipate around 3 million. We, we only know the, the number of the men, uh, but it's uh, around 3 million people probably. Uh, so that number is great. Probably so. And you imagine they're camped in this valley, Valley of Moab or Plains of Moab, and they have the uh, tabernacle in the center, and each of the tribes are in their position, so on each side of that. So that would have been quite a sight to see with three million people there gathered together, and you're up on the mountaintop looking at it. And what we see here is the children of Israel are not aware of what's going on. But we'll see here Balaam and this battle that he's going to go through, and I'm calling it a battle because uh, it's kind of a battle with God. And uh, them being able to look down on them, uh, even though the children didn't realize that and how God was really protecting the disobedient, rebellious children of Israel at this time. Yeah, and so we meet somebody in here named Balak, and so you're going to remember that name because we're going to, this three chapters worth of story, we're going to continually uh, refer to him. Right. By the way, when Bob was describing that there was the, uh, the tabernacle that all around mm -hmm. them, that was very well organized. Uh, and so they're a, they're a well organized machine by this time because they've been doing this for uh, 38 years because right. from the time they actually did moved it the first time, I think, that's right? right? That's true. And so here is Moab here, and we're dealing with the king of Moab. And what the king of Moab didn't know, that God was also protecting Moab. Because he told the children of Israel, do not go to battle with them. If he'd have known that, he probably wouldn't have been doing this. But anyway, uh, he doesn't know that. It's actually really interesting what Bob said there. God was protecting him at the same time. And That's he right. doesn't even know that. All right, let's read verses 4 through 6. So Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this company will lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. Then he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, at Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people, to call him, saying, Look, a people has come from Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth and are settling next to me. 
Therefore, please come at once. Curse this people for me, for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. All right, so we learned somebody else inside this text. Who's the person we learn here? We knew Balak. Balaam. And so you got Balak and you have Balaam. Balak is the leader or he's the kind of the king of Moab here, mm -hmm. the president, if you will. And he reaches out to a guy by the name of Balaam. And he asked Balaam to come and do what? He wanted them to curse who? Israel. Now, what did he specifically say in there that's, uh, well, I should say that I find it. Can you all tell me what I find interesting that he said? Notice what he says about Balaam. Okay, if you bless them, they'll be blessed. If you curse them, you'll be cursed. It's almost, you're almost right. There's two words that he said before that. What does he say? He says, I know. Don't miss those two words, I know. You see those two words that say, I know that who you bless will be blessed and who you curse will be cursed. What does he mean when he says, I know that? The history of it, yes. So he's, he's just not reaching out to some stranger here. Uh, there's obviously been some type of connection, and, and Balaam has done this type of stuff before. Above and, uh, he has a reputation, doesn't he? He's got a reputation. And it evidently has been successful. So he's reaching out to him. And where Balaam is from is actually, it says the river here. It actually, if you go back and look at that, he's talking about the Euphrates, his, which comes down further over here. And there is almost 400 miles from down here across there. So he evidently had a pretty good reputation about his sorcery, soothsayer, his uh, trade. And as we'll find out, uh, he, here in a moment or so, he is a prophet for hire. But it's amazing and kind of strange how God uses him. And in fact, it says God's spirit comes upon him as we go through this. But he does present some cases, and I've had people ask me, well, he seemed to worship God. He seemed to know God because he says the right words as we're going to see. And it just remind me of the many Christians today that know the right words, but their heart's not in it. Absolutely. In fact, we're going to see that exact thing play out here uh, in this story. Uh, let's read 7 through 8. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the diviner's fee in their hand. And they came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balak. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight. And I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. What's the first thing you notice that uh, uh, kind of might send up a red flag? Yeah, Joe, go ahead. You know what it is. He's doing it for money. Bob made that statement a while ago, a prophet for hire. And you notice that... Um, whether it was the fame of Balaam or, or what, but the, they knew if they were going to talk to Balaam that they had to come with some money uh, to get done what they needed done. Uh, and um, that's a pretty sad place to be. Yeah. Uh, and you notice that who did he reach out to? The elders of Midian. So he's trying to get somebody to go with him to uh, fight this battle with him. And... Uh, we see how Midian uh, gets into it. And uh, Balaam says, all right, hey, I'm going to go talk to God, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back and tell you what he says. Uh, and so let's, let's read what he says in verses 9 through 12. Then God came to Balaam and said, who are these men with you? So Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Look, a people has come out of Egypt, and they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. 
And God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Uh, it's pretty plain, the instruction that was given, isn't it? God gave him some instructions. And what was the instructions God gave him? Not to curse them, but there's something else. Don't go with them. Gave them two, two, two pieces of instructions there. Don't go with them and don't curse Israel. Um, seems pretty easy to follow, doesn't it, Brother Bob? Sure does. And it kind of makes you wonder. Now, the Lord is speaking to a pagan prophet. And, and, and like, by the way, hold on to that thought right there for me. Can I pause you just for sure. a minute? Lotus is a pagan prophet. But yet God was talking to this person. In fact, uses him through this process. God can use whatever means he wants to to accomplish his will and purpose. Amen? He's sovereign. He is absolutely sovereign. And so, um, anyway, Brother Bob, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, I wanted to point out that phrase that you used there. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting to see that, and we see how this goes and uh, we'll see how here in the next verses or so how Balaam responds to him and yeah. calls him Lord. Yeah, in fact, let's go ahead and read verses 13 through 17. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, go back to your land for the Lord has refused to give me permission to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Then Balak's, Balak again sent princes more numerous and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak the son of Zippor, Please let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will certainly honor you greatly, and I will do whatever you say to me. Therefore, please come, curse this people for me. All right, Balak. Now, who was Balak? He was the king of Moab, right? He gets the news. He's not going to come. Balak says, that's not good enough. I told you I want him to come. Let's send some more people, and let's, uh, let's try to twist his arm and say, nope, I really need you to come. Uh, and by the way, it goes back to this fear that Balak had. Uh, and Balak, isn't it? interesting that Balak is reaching out to have a people cursed by uh, a soothsayer who is saying that he's talking to God, or well, he is talking to God, uh, and not doing it. You would think that if you understood that he was talking to God, that Balak would be like, oh, okay, uh, but he doesn't, even though that's where he was reaching out to for right. help. He was reaching out, and they were so concerned about this. It's about a 20-day journey back to uh, to where Balaam is, and then they had to come back. So there's 40 days there, so there's quite an effort. So his reputation was known wide uh, throughout those nations. So they really, and what has happened? The price has gone up. The offer has gone up. In fact, look what he says. So let's play this thing and get it more than, you know, Notice yeah. what Balak says. I will do whatever you say to me. In other words, name your price. That's what Balak is saying. <laughs> name your price. Huh? A prophet for hire, a prophet for profit uh, is exactly what Balaam is here. Uh, all right, 18 and 19. Then Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now, therefore, please, you also stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. Is Balaam good or is Balaam bad? He really wants that money. <laughs> Is Balaam good or is Balaam bad? Greedy. He's what? Greedy. He is greedy. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. All Does right. Sound but like is, a sound like a child wanting something. It just keeps on, keeps on, keeps on until they get what they want. But doesn't the word sound very spiritual? Absolutely. Like, Lord does. my God. Shouldn't, shouldn't that be what, and, and so, and let's, let's just dive into what you touched on just a moment ago, because that statement right there sounds really good and really spiritual, doesn't it? And so, the question is, how many people in churches today sound really good, sound really spiritual, say the right things, raise their hands at the right song, and can say long-lasting prayers, but yet still act like Balaam. Still act like Say all the right words. Do you think maybe Balaam, Balaam thought if he failed, he could blame it on God then? In other words, I feel like he's kind of setting himself up to say, if this doesn't work, we'll blame it on God. You know what I mean? In other words, he's playing the part in saying this, uh, thinking later on maybe he does curse them, uh, but he's going to say, I can't say anything but what God says. Um, but and you said this just a minute ago in a, in a way, and I'm just going to take it down a little bit further, that Balaam was wanting to be with God and with the world at the same time. That's what you see in this story. Somebody that's trying to do both. I want to be in the world and in the church, or a follower of Christ at the same time. And folks, I have said uh, many times, it's either one or the other. You're either going to follow God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, or you're not going to follow him at all. You either got to be all in or you're all out. And yeah. Bob, how many, uh, uh, we, I mean, there's not a number, but I just wonder how many people show up in sure churches do. on in Sundays every, more, every week that, it's, they're almost like the Balaams of the world. I want, I want to say the right things, but not actually live the right live things. Live the right things. Uh, we want to look good. We want to for show, uh, but our heart doesn't take us there. Doesn't take us there. Ruth? Amen. Amen. That's a perfect way to put it. He could talk the talk, but couldn't walk the walk. And we're going to see how, how, what happens actually here, where we're going to. Let's look at verses uh, 20 and 21. And God said to Balaam at night, and came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men come to call you, rise and go with them, but only the word which I spoke, speak to you that you should do. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of with the princes of Moab. All right. Does anybody see the the real big red flag in this text right here? Look exactly. You're exactly right. The scripture says, God said, if they come to you, then you can go with them. And he got up early in the morning and saddled it. The people never came to him. Why is that? Because he really wanted that house full of silver and gold. And so he thought he had, he thought he had an end, didn't he? Right. Yes, he did. And, and, and we're like that so many ways in that when you're talking to someone and you might say, well, I might do this for you. Well, they take it and read that. You're going to do that for me. <laughs> in other words, when God said, if... Uh, they come to you. He just took and ran with it. <laughs> it absolutely. Uh, um, Matt and I were having a conversation this week, and Matt helped me remember this, what we said exactly. But we watched that movie, Nefarious. Uh, I had watched it earlier. He watched it uh, this week. Uh, and there was a statement in there about yeses. Do you remember what that statement was specifically? Uh, it's okay if you don't remember. The, the statement... Uh, about yeses the, in this if you don't know the movie there's this guy that's demon possessed and um and the demon reveals that 
it happens gradually over time where people just allow a little bit in at a time. And it just, all, all that Satan tries to do is try to get you to say yes, just a little bit, then just a little yes, then a little yes. Um, and, and it leads to somebody being overtaken by Satan. It isn't that all of a sudden they just come in and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to, this person's going to be possessed. No, this person just through these little yeses, okay, it's okay to do this. It's okay to do this. And before too long, that person can, can become possessed uh, with a demon. That's the way addiction starts. That's where affairs start. They always piece by piece. And, uh, you know, in James, it tells us that, you know, as we go through that process, sin will be conceived. So it's a normally a process where you a little more, a little more, a little more, till bang, gotcha. Until you're caught. And that's what happens right here, and that's what we were talking about. It seems it, you could logically say, well, God said if they come, and he went. And so somebody could logically say in your mind, no, what you did was a little yes. Yes, I'm going to compromise just this little bit. Yes, it's okay. I think it's going to be fine. Folks, I will tell you, we are to follow God's word, all of God's word, exactly the way that God's word tells us to follow God's word, not in leaving any parts of it out. Amen? Every part of it. He missed one little part. If they come, he didn't wait. And folks, what, just look at what happens after he does he doesn't follow the direction of God, and it and changes the rest of the story. That's the reason there's still two more chapters to go, and because he didn't follow that. And from the very beginning, to curse someone is sin. From the very beginning, to curse a nation like this, God's own people, would be sin from the start. So in other words, now we're trying to progress, and uh, rightfully that he can sin and bring judgment upon the children of Israel. Wayne? Um, well, there's another lesson, and that is, is that if you say Balaam is a false prophet, then these men, the princes of Moab, believe it. Yeah, uh, okay. Well, they're pagan worshipers, so. Yeah, but you I know. mean, they They believed him, but they also give him more, too. Well, coming up. Yeah, yeah. But that's the king, I think. Essentially. Yeah. I'm just talking about the, the messengers. The, the messengers, you're, you're right. They're, they're susceptible to, well, I mean, people get deceived all the time. You, they don't well, get deceived. It's from, the, from the leadership. Is the leadership important? Absolutely. Because these messengers are following a command. How did Hitler do so well? Because people took his message forward. So Balaam missed this little word, uh, or didn't follow the little words that said, if, they, if the men come. He didn't do that. Look at what happens and the change that takes place in verse number 22. Read verse number 22, and you'll see a, a significant change that takes place. Then God's anger was aroused. Wait. Did y'all see that change? Did you see that change? Balaam and God have been having a conversation. And everything's been fine. Balaam has been saying the right words. And even kind of doing the right thing. Until here. And look at what happened as soon as he disobeyed. Or didn't follow the very specific direction that was given. The anger of the Lord came against him. And how many people said, well, he was doing what God told him to do. And God got angry at him. Yeah. You know, they missed the little word. They missed the back. little word on the back. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. All right. So, you could, so, so at this point, if you're not reading this carefully, you could interpret it, interpret it completely different. Why, why did God get mad? He got mad because he didn't follow exactly what he told him to do. And so... And by the way, God's anger is different than ours. And so when I say God was mad, that was an illustration. But God's, God's anger is always a, a righteous and right and just anger. Um, and so he had a very good purpose for doing it. All right, go ahead. 
Verse number 22. Go ahead and read it this time. I don't know why you stopped. <laughs> <laughs> then God's anger was aroused because he went, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. Just go ahead and read through uh, verse uh, 27. This is such a cool story. Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword, with his drawn sword in his hand, and the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, so he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam's anger was aroused, and he struck the donkey with his staff. I just love this story. And by the way, it only gets better from here. But the first thing, the thing, one thing I want to point out is the reality of the spirit world that is around us that we, we never stop to think through uh, in our everyday life. Um, and this angel that the, the um, donkey sees I think that the, the, the spirit world was always there. God just opened it, the donkey's eyes to be able to see this angel as this took place. But also notice the way that the, the donkey responded whenever it saw something in the spirit world. It was like, whoa. I mean, literally, whoa. It was aware of the danger, right? It, it was yeah. aware that, uh, hey, something. And who is the angel of the Lord? Anyone? There's a lot of people saying Jesus, brother. Right. Yeah, you see it capitalized here, and we uh, tend to believe that translation means it's a manifestation of the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Standing there, and that's uh, the way that the donkey responds. And, uh, of course, isn't it interesting that a donkey can see it, but yet Balaam, who's been having this conversation with God, doesn't see it. Um, let's read verse okay. number. Okay. But with Balaam and his intent and his, uh, I guess his thinking or his attitude at this time, he not he just going. <laughs> he's just going. He, you know. He's ready to go get that money. <laughs> uh, let's read verse twenty-eight. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, "What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times?" <laughs> it's just one. Of, I just love that. And donkey's laying there and looks over at Balaam. Why are you hitting me for? <laughs> I think that's just so cool. But read the very next verse. And Balaam said to the donkey, because you have abused me, I wish there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. What's really funny about that? He's talking to the donkey, and he doesn't even realize it. So if you find yourself talking to a donkey, beware. Beware. <laughs> I just, that, those two verses right there are so funny. The donkey talks. If I were Balaam and my donkey started talking to me, I think I'd be like, what is up? But he doesn't. He's like, I want to kill you. He doesn't even acknowledge the fact that the, fact that the donkey is talking. Now. I also think it's interesting that he said he, if he had, what did he need to kill the donkey? What did the donkey see? A sword. Isn't it interesting that the thing that Balaam says he wants is exactly what the donkey saw? What are you thinking, Doug? I know you got some on your mind, brother. I can tell. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Is there any correlation between verse 22 says God's anger was aroused and then in 27 Balaam's anger was aroused? Are you saying the word? It used the exact same words. 
Yeah, I actually saw that too, uh, Ruth, that the same phrase that God's anger was aroused and then uh, Balaam was like almost responds, that same phrase is used. Uh, and I will tell you that what I see in it is God's righteous justice anger and Balaam's unrighteous anger uh, is what you're seeing there between the two. And how that, that's the way that we can be. Uh, let's see. Let's read verses 29 through 30. And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have abused me, I wish there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. So the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden, ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever di disposed to do this to you? And he said, No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, donkey, you're right. <laughs> That's true. It really is. So you've had some of those? <laughs> hey. <laughs> he has this conversation, and the donkey says, Dude, I've been, your, I've been a good donkey. Oh, have I ever done this to you? Balaam's like, oh, no, nah. I'm sorry. He really doesn't say I'm sorry here. Now let's read verse uh, 31 through 33. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you, because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely I would also have killed you by now and let her live. <laughs> Wow, now, if you're Balaam, you just had your donkey talking to you and you didn't respond to that, but notice the way he responds when he sees the angel of the Lord. What did he do? Fell on his face. As I read that in that phrase, I was reminded of that song, I Can Only Imagine, in the way that that song paints the picture of the way that you're going to respond whenever you see Christ for the first time. Can I tell you, the way that I read, according to Scripture, the way that most people respond whenever they see Christ is exactly the way he responds, fall on their face. I know that that song paints, you know, maybe I'll dance, maybe, you know, I'll do this, maybe I'll fall on my face. I think that the natural reaction is going to be fall on your face before him when you finally see him. Yeah, we find that John in Revelation does that, but it's before an angel, and he tells him not to. He did. But he did uh, recognize it was an angelic being from God, and he did the same thing. And notice there that um, it's very plain that Balaam would know that he has messed up. It's very plain that he has done something wrong. I wonder if Balaam has connected the fact that he said if and he went anyway. Has he connected it? Some of y'all have read ahead because he has not. Um, do we want to, mm, how much further we got in this chapter? Yeah, let's finish this chapter. Can we just finish this chapter? Sure. All right, let's read, let's go, uh, verses, th let's read verse 34. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. All right, sounds good, right? Go ahead, verse number 35. Then the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I speak to you, that you, sh that you shall speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. I think this is really interesting that he gets the direction to go ahead and go. Because it comes back to 
he was set his mind on going, and so he was going to go. He gets this wake-up call, and we don't know how close he was at the time to being down here to uh, Balak's place, but for whatever reason, and, and I think that as we study through this, we'll find the reason, says, yep, go ahead and go. You've come this far. Let's go ahead and go. What are you look, Bob's looking for something. Are you ready for it, well, What I was thinking in that is that uh, God tells in Romans 1 about giving them over to a debased mind. So he, after we do certain things and we're not obeying God's direction or we keep on, he will let you do that. And in Romans 1, yeah. verses 24, 26, and 28, separate them out here. Therefore, God gave them up to uncleanness and their lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Now he's talking about a different subject here, but it can apply. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. And then 28, and even they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness. Yeah, so you're right. God did Say, all right, you've gone this far. You just keep going then. Yeah, if that's I'm, what you want to do. If this is what you want to do, I'm going to let you do it. Uh, let's read verses 36 through 39. Now, when Balak heard that Bal Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab, which is on the border of the Arnon, the boundary of the territory. Then Balak said to Balaam, did I not earnestly send to you, calling for you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? And Balaam said to Balak, Look, I have come to you. Now have I any power at all to say anything? The word that God put, puts in my mouth, that I must speak. So Balaam went with Balak, and they came to Kirjath Hazoth. Then Balak offered oxen and sheep, and he sent some to Balaam and to the princes who were with him. All right, so Balak's still trying to, still trying to get his way. Uh, he kind of goes out there and complains to him. Uh, and then let's read verse number 41. So it was the next day that Balaam took ba Balak took Balaam and brought him up to the high places of Baal, that from there he might observe the extent of the people. Yeah, and actually I've always thought that this goes with the next chapter. I should have stopped because it really <laughs> goes with the next chapter uh, with what we're yeah. going to look at. So we see a meet here. If this is the river Arnon, and that was the northern border. And the king had came out to meet him. How many times did that happen? So he's really honoring Balaam by coming out of that. And he's going to take him up on a high mountain to view the uh, people, the nation of Israel, as they said in there. All right. Balaam, this story of Balaam and Balak is, that's one chapter of the three. So we're a third of the way through. I'm doing really good at math, aren't I, brother? <laughs> Very good. Any thoughts about uh, what has happened so far? Curtis? That's, that's really, really interesting. Uh, I, I never thought about that. But, yeah, God basically does say the same thing to Job that the donkey said to, to Balaam. It's like, I've, I've always done this for I've always been here for you. Why are you turning against me now? <laughs> it is. It, it, that is true, too. <laughs> Lisa? Oh, okay. By saying he could go on and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, still has this chance. That's a, that's a, it really could be that he, he, it's a demonstration of the grace of God, giving him another chance to do what is right. Uh, and he starts to here again. It seems like it. Hmm. 
I, I, I know I hadn't thought of that, uh, so I don't know what to do with that information. But isn't it, yeah, but isn't it interesting still to think about this? God, God will use whatever God wants to use to get his will accomplished. Even if it's a donkey, talking, knocking, talking. That's hard to say sometimes for me. Well, Mr. Ed could talk. <laughs> So the cursing, uh, you said without going too deep in it, what is that about? Uh, the cursing that they're talking about here uh, honestly is a, a, a satanic type of a curse. Uh, that it's, it's not that they're trying to use God to do something that the devil would, would have done. Yeah, nations then believed if they won battles, it was their God had delivered them. So they have seen the children of Israel and how they have defeated the Amorites and the battles that they've had so far, that they believe that their God is superior to any God that they have, and what we want to do is curse them and weaken, weaken them spiritually. So we want to get them crossways with their God. And if we can do that, then we can control and defeat them. And, and we'll see that uh, Balaam... Does he's, he continues to try to walk this fine line between the world and, and the spiritual. Uh, in fact, uh, he actually does some real harm to the nation of Israel uh, through this process. Yes, he does. Yeah, I think that um, what we see in our nation today is exactly what Bob read over in Romans chapter 1, that, that God has said, y'all have pushed me out for, for too long, and I'm going to go ahead and turn you over to a debased mind. And, and, and I think that is absolutely what we see going on. And I was sharing with the guy I was running with the other day that uh, this, this thought that I know all of y'all have is I think that I think that it's only going to get worse. I think that I'm afraid that we've crossed the line too far. Uh, and even the the sign that you referenced at the very beginning, you know, is is an example, just one example of it seems like millions that have gone on inside our nation that has caused this to happen. So right? <laughs> yeah I, I, I hear you in fact I was like I think you're defending Balaam here <laughs> like, uh, but I, I hear what you're saying it sure is awful funny though to read it you know the way that we get treated without living it he was living it yeah any other questions or thoughts
Yeah. Yeah, I think that's... Yeah, what could happen. Uh, I, I, I agree with you. And, uh, we were meeting with the Sunday school teachers and um, man, it's such a good time to meet with our Sunday school teachers and talk through from uh, Marge's class, which is pre-K, all the way through our youth of having, you know, answers in Genesis being taught, uh, a, a curriculum that is about, um, um, what's that word, um, apologetics, so that it will build this solid foundation that you're talking about. And I think that we as a church must be doing that. And I was so appreciative to all of the teachers saying, hey, we want to continue this curriculum and we're going to, we're going to stick to it. And, and so it, it was very encouraging. But to your point, Val, yeah, I think that you, there will, you will see a falling away as times uh, get hard. I think scripture teaches that. And it's sad that we might even know some of the people that that would happen to. That that they're not founded in their faith strong enough. And we have to remember that what uh, we tolerate, our children will embrace. And that is a very scary it thing. It is scary. It is scary. Too many yeses. They haven't That's been where point. you've been. They're only coming from uh, much less experience, much less knowledge. And uh, it's a real danger. Too many S's. All right, anyone else? Ray? I'm Ray. You're not Ray. You're Joe. Mm. I, yeah, Judas yeah. Is that. Judas yeah. throwing the money back. Yeah. There was no remorse. Yeah. Great, great observation, brother. Well, well, praise be to God, uh, and I appreciate you. But, but I'll tell you, it is more encouraging for uh, us to see people like you that are joining and following and being faithful uh, to the service of the king. One thing we said whenever we started the church was we want to grow in numbers, but we're just as concerned about depth as we are in numbers as width. And so, uh, and I think that we're holding to the truth of that, um, but um, we want numbers to grow. But we're going to be we're going to be teaching the truth that's inside there, and we want it in from again um, from the very beginning that pre K we're starting to teach that to the children uh, through the church, and we're going to con we will absolutely continue that, Frank. Oh, it was. Oh, wow, that's cool. Uh, uh, if you didn't hear, Frank, uh, what Bert Harper and Alex McFarland talked about uh, was all about uh, uh, what we've just talked through here. How to find a good church. Yep. Man. And it comes from the leadership. Yeah, God is good. I'll embarrass God, him now. <laughs> yeah, God is good. Amen? Anybody else? Uh, if not, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, Lord God, thank you so much for this evening and thank you for your word. You're an amazing God. Yes. And Father, whenever we read these stories um, uh, and even some that makes us laugh like a donkey that talked, Father, the truth that we see in there, and there's so much truth, the importance of following every word of what you've given us to follow, the reality of the spirit world that is around about us, and the Father, the, the point about grace uh, that can be given to us, that you will let, that sometimes we do mess up, but you will give us another chance. Father, there's so many examples just in this one chapter of recognizing who you are and the way that you treat us and the way that you desire that we would follow after you. 
Father, I ask that you'll have your hand upon this church. Guide us, Father, into all truth. Let us be a light in this dark and dying world that we are led by your spirit. And we ask this all in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen.